The Cancer Project is a non-profit organization advancing cancer prevention and survival through nutrition, education, and research. This Food for Life nutrition and cooking class, designed by physicians, nutrition experts, and registered dietitians, includes medical information about how foods and nutrients affect cancer growth. The Food for Life series offers an entertaining cooking demonstration of simple and healthy recipes that can be recreated easily at home. Here is Dr. Neil Barnard, president of the Cancer Project. Hi, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Researchers have tried to tease apart which parts of the foods that we eat might be actually responsible for increasing our cancer risk and what kind of dietary patterns reduce that risk. And one of the things that they've really zeroed their attention in on is meat. Why? Because in countries with a lot of cancer, we tend to be meat eaters. And in countries where there's not a lot of cancer, I'm talking about Asian countries, the staple is something different. In Japan, the staple is not a pork chop. The staple is rice, noodles, that sort of thing. And as these countries have westernized their diets, bringing in meat in a big way, cancer rates have risen. So the point is, in these Asian countries, meat is at most just a condiment for other foods as opposed to being the main dish. And in some religious traditions, they don't consume it at all. Well, why would meat be linked to cancer risk? One of the reasons is that meat itself actually delivers carcinogens to your plate. I mean cancer-causing chemicals. And it works like this. Let's say I take a burger or a steak or a chicken filet, and I put it on a grill, and I heat it up, and I put it then on, onto my plate. Well, if I analyze it, you'll find cancer-causing chemicals were formed sometime while it was on the grill. What's happening is that the heat, the intense heat of the grilling process, causes a change in the animal muscle tissue so that carcinogens called heterocyclic amines actually start to form. And if you swallow them, they increase your risk of cancer. Dozens of studies have shown that these cancer-causing chemicals that come from heating up meat are linked to certain forms of cancer. Now, they form in red meat, but they also form in a big way on fish and also on chicken. Now, Americans now eat, believe it or not, about a million chickens per hour. We eat a huge amount of chicken. And people are saying, well, I don't want to eat red meat. I want to eat more white meat, as if that's going to be healthier. So they're eating a lot of chicken. They're not realizing that the biggest single source of these carcinogenic, these cancer-causing heterocyclic amines, is actually chicken. And people are eating it grilled because you don't want to eat it fried. That's full of fat. That'll fatten you up. That's all true. But the grilled chicken is actually the biggest contributor to these heterocyclic amines in the body. I'm just trying to cheer everybody up. OK? So you're thinking back, oh, what did I eat yesterday? Well, OK, let's do an experiment. Let's say I take a burger, and I'm going to take a chicken breast, and I'm going to take a veggie burger. I grill the burger. It gets nice and hot, and I analyze it. What's inside? You got it. The carcinogens are there. What if I take the chicken breast, and I grill that, and I send it to the lab? Are there carcinogens there? You bet. What happens if I grill a veggie burger? It gets warm. That's all. The nice thing is that, that plant products tend not to produce these heterocyclic amines, which is a good thing. But that's not the only reason why meat might contribute to cancer. In fact, it may not even be the main reason. Meat has a lot of fat in it. It doesn't have any fiber in it. You know, meat's not a plant, so it doesn't have plant roughage in it. And so what that means is that high fat, low fiber combination tends to affect your hormones. If you don't have fiber in your diet and you have a lot of fat, estrogen in a woman's body, testosterone in a man's body starts to increase. And if I'm centering my diet, not around rice and vegetables, but around that big chunk of meat, then my hormones are likely to get out of control. So researchers have put this to the test. Do meat eaters really have more cancer or not? And the answer is they sure do. At Harvard University, they've looked at colon cancer. And a man or a woman who eats meat every day, particularly red meat, has about three times the risk of colon cancer compared to men or women who tend to avoid it. So it makes a big difference. Now, you might say, well, what about fish? I hear fish is OK. Well, fish has a lot of fat, doesn't have any fiber. And if I grill fish, same story. I'm going to find those same heterocyclic amines in the fish as well. So 
The other thing, by the way, about fish is a lot of people are saying, well, yeah, but it's got good fat in it. Y you know what I'm talking about, the omega-3 fatty acids. That's true, it does. Uh, but the omega-3s are only part of the story. All fats are mixtures. Fish has saturated fat in it, bad fat. Sa saturated fat is the kind that raises your cholesterol. It's the kind that's associated with higher breast cancer risk. So fish fat brings you good fat, brings you bad fat too. So by now you're thinking, well, I guess maybe the healthiest diet is a vegetarian diet. Well, turns out that's true. If you compare vegetarians, they've got about 40% less cancer risk compared to everybody else. And when I say vegetarians, I mean casual vegetarians. The vegetarian off the street who's eating healthy food, but also the occasional French fry and barbecue potato chips and whatnot, they have about 40% less cancer compared to other people. Well, what if, what if I'm a careful vegetarian? So I'm avoiding the, the meats and the dairy products, but I'm really bringing in the vegetables and the fruits and the high fiber foods. You can affect your cancer risk even more. And it's a good move because if you're just going, as a lot of people do, if you're just going from beef to chicken, here's exactly how far that gets you. The leanest beef is about 29% fat as a percentage of calories. The leanest chicken, without the skin, without the dark meat, it's about 23 Fish vary, some are low, some are high, or lower, I should say, some are higher, some are a lot higher. Uh, salmon, Chinook salmon, about 50% fat. Broccoli is 8% fat, beans are 4. Rice is between 1 and 5, depending on the variety. A potato is 1% fat. A yam, sweet potato, 1% fat. That's a way to really get away from the fat, really bring in the fiber. So if you avoid the meat products, what are you doing? You're avoiding the carcinogens. You're avoiding the hormone changing effects that these foods have, and you're allowing room in your diet to bring the healthy things in. All the vegetables and fruits and things are coming in. Now, you might say, well, am I gonna get enough protein? You hear people say that, right? Oh, well, vegetarians get enough protein. And Francis Moore LePay wrote a really good book a few years ago called Diet for a Small Planet. Any of you ever see this book? She said, if we follow a vegetarian diet, we could save this planet. We could feed hungry, pe hungry people, and that's true, because instead of feeding all the feed grains to animals to get this little bit of meat out, we can eat the grains directly. But she made one mistake. She said, to get adequate protein, you need to eat food in certain combinations. She had a list of grains and said, eat them with the beans, and if one is missing something, the other will make up for it. And that's sort of true, except the American Dietetic Association looked at this and said, it's actually much easier. If you eat any normal combination of plant foods, you get all the protein that you're ever gonna need. So you don't need to do this protein complementing. You don't have to do that. Just eat any normal combination of foods that your tastes call for, and you're gonna get all the protein that you need. So if you wanna complement your proteins, just say something nice about them. That's all you have to do. Now, people do freak out about this a little bit. I was flying once, and uh, back in the old days when they used to provide meals in flight, um, I would always order the vegetarian meal because you get served first. And uh, there's a guy sitting there next to me. He says, why did you get served and the rest of us haven't? I said, well, I just ordered a special meal. Well, what kind is vegetarian? Oh, you're a vegetarian, are you? Don't you feel kind of weak? <laughs> and so the psychoanalyst in me leapt to the fore and I said, well, what's your image of strong? Give me a strong animal. Oh, he said, I'm strong like a, like a bull or a, a stallion or a, a gorilla, an elephant. These are all vegans, okay? Well, you get the point. Uh, a pussycat is a meat eater. A bull or a stallion gets that massive rippling musculature from plant, fruit, plant foods. And what that means is that plants have protein in them. You may not realize it, but if you take some broccoli, about 40% of it is protein. If you take beans, they're about 30% protein. And if you take tofu, it's about 40% protein. So the animal protein is the one you want to get away from. The plant proteins, the same one that makes animals strong, is the one that you want to have. If you look at what is in meat, it's really just a mixture of protein and fat. There isn't any fiber in it. There isn't any complex carbohydrate in it. There isn't any vitamin C in it. It's protein mixed with fat plus the occasional parasite perhaps, but from a nutritional standpoint, I mean, it's really just protein mixed with fat. Now, we all really grew up with meat-based diets. I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, and that was the only way we knew to eat. Today, we know better. Today, we're discovering the advantages of plant-based nutrition. Thank you.